I want to talk a little bit about the world, some things God has shown me, where we are. I'll pray here in a moment. Kevin, okay, I've been deeply in prayer over Lahaina and Maui. We've probably been to Maui, I think we've been to the Hawaiian Islands 55 to 60 times. We've been to Maui many times as well. We've, in fact, preached in Lahaina. It's one of the most beautiful communities, and we'll be going there next week. Um, and when tragedies like this hit us, and I've lived in war and seen people killed and gone through disasters as a Christian worker, I want you to understand when, that, when Maui and the terrors of behind and the fire hit me, the Bible says we've heard of all the pain of Job and we've seen the end of the Lord. I'm here to tell you in that terrible tragedy, with what the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good in the life of many. You, it's hard to see it now. I've walked through terrible tragedy. God will touch that island supernaturally. His spirit will permeate that island. Watch in the next six to 16 months what he does there. I'm going to entitle this message from fretting to faith. The word fret, as it's translated in the English, is used four times in the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's a very unique word. It speaks of an angry worry, just a deep anxiety, an angry anxiety because things are out of control and you're helpless. So I'm going to entitle this message from fretting to faith, living is light in this dark hour. How many of you know the world is very complex right now? It's a very frightening place to live. America's terribly polarized right now. We see so many crazy political things. Who can count them? You say, Pastor Jim, are you partisan about politics? No, only about Jesus. I vote my conscience, but quite honestly, when I look at the American political scene, I can feel deeply orphaned by both parties over one issue or the other. We have a major war in Europe with talk of nuclear weapons. It's a scary time. The economy, inflation. What's the answer? I'll never forget in October 2022, talking to some of our leaders from Ukraine, the Holy Spirit came on me and I told him, Russia's going to invade you. But you're not to be afraid. There's going to be a land grab, but God will slap the bear's paw. When I sat in February before the invasion in 2022, Holy Spirit said next week, on, beginning on Monday, Russia's going to invade Ukraine. It'll end up worse for them than Afghanistan. It's not going to go the way they expected. Don't be afraid. I'm going to use this for my glory. I saw all of Eastern Europe, all the countries around Russia, from the Baltic states to Scandinavian countries, being awakened by the Holy Spirit. By the way, I've been all through Russia, work with hundreds of churches there. But God's up to something. And I think we, we face a choice. In this hour, we can have faith or we can fret. I love the song, Lord said revival, Lord said it. Now, how many of you love that? And I think that song is so apropos now because the Bible says, ask for rain in the time of the latter rain. And I believe we've entered one of those moments in history that as a country, the United States has experienced, at least in the last 150 years, more revival than any other country. In fact, we're sitting in a state that experienced one of the greatest revivals in human history. I believe it was the 1840s, wasn't it, Billy? In fact, the largest church in the world, wasn't that on the Big Island, if I'm not mistaken? The largest church in the whole world was 10,000 people on the Big Island. This nation's known the move of God's Spirit. In Acts 3, 19 and 20, it says, Repent, turn from your sins, that they can be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Throughout American history, at every critical juncture, going back before the Revolutionary War, before the Civil War, um, 
before the world wars um, in the 1960s, God's never failed to meet this nation. And once again, I believe we've come to a time where God is going to send revival. Why is that so important? Because when God begins to step down from heaven and touch a nation, touch a state, touch a city, the church is renewed and precious lost men and women we love so much are drawn to Christ. We know God is always near. Through the work on the cross, we've been brought near to him. But when a time of refreshing, quote, revival comes, quote, it's a radical nearness, if I may use that word easier to find him, sense him, see him. Like, why would I believe that? Why do I believe we're in a period of time like that? And then why is it important for me? It really goes back, as you've heard me say, to December 31st, 2018. And that's, that was New Year's Eve. I was in Nashville at our home church, Bethel World Outreach Center, one of our great every nation churches. And the Lord came to me five minutes before I preached. And showed me what was coming on America. The crisis, the pain, the, um, the ethnic tension and pain. I told him that night would come 18 months later. It shook me. I saw the West Coast shake and New York City swamped. But over and over that night, as I stood before the church and told them what was coming, the Lord spoke to me and said this, America will not die in anarchy. America's not gonna fall apart. America's gonna have revival. Remember May 18th and 19th of 2019 when I saw this, this river of death coming out of China, going into every nation of the world, killing people. I thought, man, what was it? I didn't know until later that was COVID flowing into the world. But all during those years and months, I had a deep sense that what the enemy has meant for evil, God has meant for good. June 9th, 2022, praying in my office, I had this sense of Jesus praying. A strong impression. One more time, Father. One more time, Father. One more time, Father. He said, yes, and I just saw like a raindrop fall from heaven. He said, Jim, the first drops of revival are coming. Don't be afraid. It's not business as usual. I've heard the prayers of my people. August 24th, Birmingham, Alabama. I laid down to take a nap before seeing a friend just so burdened for war revival. In a moment, I had an impression of my mind of the UK. No one knew publicly the queen was sick. The Union Jack was at half mask. People were just mourning all through Scotland, all through Northern Ireland, all through England, all through Wales. The flag was at half mask. I said, man, who has died? What's died? Jesus grabbed the flag, jerked the lanyard. The flag stormed to the top. He said, I've not forgotten my promises. My glory will come to the UK. A week later, he said, when the Queen of England dies, you'll know that revival is imminent in the world. All over the world, all over nations, there's a fresh presence of God in the middle of pain, in the middle of crisis, in the middle of war, in the middle of fear. God's showing up in power. February 3rd, I was sitting in front of my world map and all of a sudden I saw these storm clouds, these thunderheads, they looked like pillars of the cloud, by the way. Coming across to America, God said, Jim, storms of my spirit are coming. The next week you may have heard of that little Asbury revival, little teeny university, one stoplight, 6,000 people lived there. For 14 to 17 days, God showed up in a little wooden chapel, 70,000 people visited, a million hits on TikTok, 200 kids from different kids from university, 200 universities showed up. Why? God showed up. Now, I want to tell you in the middle of all the pain, in the middle of all the brokenness, God's up to something. And I think we have to choose, will we have faith for what God is going to do right here in Honolulu? Will we have faith for what God is going to do right here at Pearlside, right here at the other campuses of this great church? When I sat in worship and I loved the songs we sang, I just felt this straining in my spirit. You know what I felt? The straining of a church trying to embrace the people God's getting ready to bring. The infrastructure, the growth classes. Beloved, let me tell you this. 
it's always darkest before the dawn of a new age of God's spirit. The problem is many of us are in danger of fretting away this opportunity. In Psalms 37, one through eight, it says, don't fret because of evil. Don't be envious when evil prospers. It'll soon fade. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself for the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. He'll act. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light, your justice at noonday. Be still before the Lord. Wait. Fret not yourself when evil prospers, when evil desires are carried out. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not. Right now, the church is fretting. They're anxious. They're angry. And the reason they are is they feel so helpless. We feel helpless to deal with the things ripping our culture. We feel helpless to deal with the world events that seem just to be cascading on us. Many times we feel helpless to help that child we love so much is being torn apart. And when someone begins to feel helpless, they end up with an angry anxiety, wanting to strike out, not knowing what to do. And may I tell you today, you can choose between faith and fretting. Whenever God has moved historically, it's always been a time of great anxiety. It's always been a time of great pain. But may I tell you, the answers to this world's pain are not in Washington, D.C. They're not in Beijing. They're not in the United Nations. I've had the privilege of speaking and praying with many world leaders, many of our great leaders in America. My first foray into the White House was many, many years ago during a crisis in my early 30s. Ended up God showing me some things that got to the White House. And I got a phone call from the wife of the president's best friend. She was a great woman of prayer. And she said this, my husband and the president are Christians, but they're scared to death. They don't know what to do. Let's pray. We prayed a half hour. There is a young man praying. And I begin to realize that the real power in the world, the one institution the devil fears is not political. It's not business. It's not education. It is the church. The one institution the enemy cannot, the enemy cannot prevail against is the church. And the reason we have the power at this moment needed to touch the world is the root of our world's problems are not political. They're not ideological. They are spiritual in nature. And we are the only answers with the darkness wiping us out. Beloved, let me tell you, it's always darkest before the dawn. We're in the midnight hour. A new day is coming on the world. A new day is coming to Honolulu. A new day is coming to a broken Maui. A new day is coming to Eastern Europe. A new day is coming where it only seems dark. What is the midnight hour? The new day has come. It's too dark to see it yet. And you have the answer. In your brokenness, in your pain, we have been given a mandate. You are the light of the world. When Jesus came into the earth, he said, I am the light of the world. When he left, he said, you're the light of the world. Not just Billy, not just Tim, not just this great team. You are why? Because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you with the very power of God. And when that is ignited, you burn like a light. It says in Isaiah 61 through three, arise and shine. Isaiah is speaking to a people who are going to be ethnically cleansed, slaughtered, enslaved, deported. Arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises on you. Darkness will cover the earth. Thick dark. How many of you feel like, man, the darkness in our culture is thick. Raise your hand. It's just thick. But the Lord will arise on you. His glory will be seen on you. And nations shall come to your light. Kings to the brightness of your rising. As a young boy, my my parents would take my sister and I and my brother to Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. 
like some of the biggest caverns and caves in all the world, black as pitch, and they'd light a match. And that match, no matter how large and suffocating the darkness, would shine. The greatest canopy for God's work is darkness. It says in Philippians 2.15, be blameless, be innocent. The children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation whom you shine as lights in the world. I know it's dark. Many of you are in deep pain at home. Child's broken your heart. One of you here, you're a woman. Illness has just sapped your strength. There's a curvature in your spine affecting your nerves. It's just hard to walk. You can barely straighten your back. It's hard to sleep. God sees your pain. The migraines piercing you. you feel like your head's being bombed. So many migraines piercing you, you can barely hear. Jesus is here to heal you today. Seize your pain. Seize your hurt. I know it's hard. I know it's dark. I know it is. But here is our might. It's a prophecy about the part of Israel that would be shattered and conquered over and over. It says there'll be no more gloom for those in anguish. In the former time, it says what happened to this land but it says this, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them light is shown. No matter what darkness you're facing, no matter how dark it seems in Honolulu or Nashville where Kathy and I live, or in Kiev where we have every nation churches. One of our pastors got on a call recently because I've got my new preaching suit. It was a bulletproof vest and a helmet. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what the darkness is, it says in John 4, John 1, 4 and 5, in him was life, speaking of Jesus, that was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Unequivocally, darkness cannot overcome light. If there's anything history tells us, prosperity is far more destructive to the church than persecution. Darkness can't overcome it. I was recently with many of our pastors from mainland China where they're being persecuted heavily. I was with 21 pastors and their spouses. Then I was deep in Vietnam with our leaders from Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, persecuted, standing for their faith, but darkness cannot overcome them. It says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, this is the God we serve. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. The same God that said, let there be light over a dark earth being formed. The same God whose spirit hovered over the waters can speak into spiritual darkness and say, let there be light. Kathy and I have people, relatives we love, we're praying for that are living in darkness. When our own children was lost to us, broken, hurting, like disappeared off the map, destroyed. God said, fear not, at 30 he will return. A text at 30, send me a Bible, Dad. Never give up. Light is greater than darkness. And if God lives in you, you have all the fuel you need to be a burning, shining light. Let me model this for you in a moment. How does this work? Hear me now. Nothing takes God by surprise. He's surprised by nothing. He says God does nothing in the world without showing one of his servants first. And when it's the darkest, I love that story in the book of John. They'd been fishing all night. It says Jesus stood on the shore. They could not see him. It was too dark. But at the dawn, he was there. It says our model, there's one who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony he bears is true. 
You said to John, he told about me, not that I needed the testimony, but I say these things so you can be saved. He was a burning, shining light. If you don't burn, you will not shine. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. The power of God lives in you. If you will, the oil of the anointing is in you. What will ignite it? What will it take for you to burn? And if you don't burn, you won't shine. And if you don't shine, it'll be dark where you are. You say, what's the answer to the darkness, you? What's the answer to the darkness in my workplace, you? What's the answer to the darkness in my neighborhood, you? I've lived with people killed in my streets, executed, walked out the door, they're dead. Firefights breaking out in the streets. What is the answer to darkness? I've lived under terrorism, people afraid, children being kidnapped. What is the answer? You, me. Jesus said, I baptize you with water for repentance. John the Baptist said, pardon me. But one who is coming after me mightier than I, I'm not even fit to carry his tennis shoes. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Listen to me. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. He reconnected you to God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit himself, the third person, and the very life, peace, and power of God is in you. Many of you have been baptized in the Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. What will it take to ignite you? What will it take? We are the church, not just every nation, the church, big C, the only ones that can pierce this darkness. We're the only ones. On the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were filled with the spirit. They spoke in tongues. The power of God fell. God wants to ignite you tonight. I'll be practical here in a moment. Some of you may have seen the movie Jesus Revolution. Everybody see that movie? It swept my generation in the late 1960s and 70s. America so broken, so divided. Good things were happening. God was touching the ethnic pain in our nation. Bad things were happening as well. Rampant immorality. Drug trafficking. In Haight-Ashbury, the summer of love, 1967, a group of broken hippies were saved. The rest is history. Begin to move up toward Oregon, down toward Los Angeles and San Diego. Hundreds and thousands of my generation were saved. Rushed across the country. In 1971, it came to my high school, my progressive Southern California high school. How many of you felt God's presence tonight? That's what lunch felt like at my high school. There was no one preaching. Becoming born again became the thing to do. By the hundreds, we'd sit and cry at lunch outside. We'd raise our hands in worship. God permeated the atmosphere. But unfortunately, beloved, we're mired. What would keep us from shining? What would keep us from burning? First baskets, it says, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. But people don't light a lamp and put it under a basket or a bushel basket. It's a basket used for carrying produce there in the biblical days. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. How's our, bas how's our light go on a basket? What might cover your light? Could it be you're so broken that you don't live much differently than your neighbors? Could it be that your pain covers up your light? Your sin, 
obscures your light. Sadly, for much of the American church, they've put their hope in politics, not Christ. And they've been bitterly disappointed every time. The Bible says if you want your light to shine, put it on the lampstand. That's the church, by the way. Being a committed part of a local church and being trained is the key to having your light shine. And then there are battles. If our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Beloved ones, listen to me. We're in a spiritual fight. There's a very real enemy. There's a very real demonic realm who wants to blind precious people who don't know Christ to the light around them. When I was here tonight in the beginning of the service, I could feel deep spiritual warfare. You know why? The enemy is not omniscient, but he knows a great outbreak of light is coming and he's doing everything to restrain it. Many of you felt heavy and you don't know why. You felt like you're walking through mud. You don't know why. You wonder, why aren't the antibiotics working for my kids? Why are we fighting so much? Sometimes it's just spiritual. The enemy fears the light in you more than he fears anything else. Fears it. You say, I'm, I'm the only person I'm dangerous to is myself. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. God lives in you. If you're born again, you're a carrier of the light of the gospel. A light that cannot be quenched in darkness. But we have blindness issues. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. If your light's darkness, how great is the darkness? What you focus on in the end determines how much light flows out of you. Oh, yes, right. I shouldn't look at pornography. Yes, we know that. But I want to know, are you reading more bad news than good news? Do news sites filled with their propaganda dominate your mind? Darken your eyes. News basically glorifies pain in order to get you to read. If I did not spend more time in the good news of God's word, that I spent in the bad news of new sites, I'd live in despair. What are you focusing on? What are you turning to? What are you listening to? What comes out of your mouth? Beloved, listen to me. Whatever you look at will fill you. Whatever you live in will fill you. People say, where do you get your news? The Bible. I don't, I yes, I'll listen to a news site from time to time. Many of them are so propaganda filled, I can't read them. But I'll try to find news. But the good news of God must dominate me. Some of you, you're just burned out. There's a parable in Matthew 25, 1 through 10. There were 10 virgins. Virgins used in the Bible, someone pure, someone living holy. And they're going to a wedding. Five were dumb, five were wise. All virgins, all pure. But what would determine their future was how much oil they had. Oil in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit, God's power, staying filled. It says the bridegroom, speaking of Jesus, tarried. And it got really dark. And it got really sleepy. He didn't show up. So all of a sudden, at the midnight hour, the bridegroom comes. He's coming for the bride. He's stepping into history. All ten virgins woke up. Five could ignite the oil. Five were out. Beloved, listen to me. The Bible commands to stay filled with the Spirit. Are you worshiping? Are you reading that word? You need, listen to me, beloved. You need to be filled with God in this hour. The Bible says, do not be drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with his spirit. Life is so painful, you've got to be filled with something. 
I wish this was simply about you. I wish this was simply about you having a better life or a better marriage, but it's not. It's about your neighborhood, your family, your business, your life. The Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, you used to be darkness. That's heavy. You used to be a part of the very fabric of darkness yourself. But now you're a child of light. Let me summarize this, beloved. It's easy to fret right now. It's so easy to feel helpless right now. Most of the people you find that are so angry politically, they're angry because they're afraid. They're angry because they feel helpless. They're angry because they feel powerless to save themselves from what they fear. Don't buy into that. The church has the greatest power in the world. I'm not afraid of the dark as long as I have a light. You say, Pastor Jim, why did he make me the light of the world? Because light shines well out of a broken vessel. Listen to me, beloved ones. We're the hope of the world. I'm sorry to put that on you, but the Bible puts it on you. You are the light of the world. God lives in you. But as you serve, as you pray, as you read the word, as the foundations are laid in your life, the Holy Spirit is ignited in you. Doesn't take much. The woman at the well, been married five times, now living with a man sexually broken. One brief encounter with Jesus. She walked in, preached the worst sermon in the Bible history. Hey, there's a guy out there. He might be the Messiah. Who knows? But he told me everything I ever did. Revival broke out. Why? Light. It's light. You say, there was a lot of darkness in my life. It's the perfect canopy for light. It's you. God's going to freshly visit your island, your state. But it starts with you. And it starts with me. Don't give in to fretting. Don't give in to angry anxiety. Many of you lose your victory out of your mouth. There's no hope. It stinks. I do the same myself sometimes. But the fact of it is, there is hope. As long as there's one Christian alive on this planet. No matter how you feel today, Christ lives in you if you've born again. If you've invited him to your heart and submitted him as Savior, Lord, God lives in you. Pastor Tim's going to join me up here now. If you would say today, I need God to deliver me from fretting and freshly fill me with his life, raise your hand and wave at me. If your hands are up, stand to your feet. It's most of you. Just stand up all over the room. If your hand went up, you stand up. Let's pray together. Jesus, I turn from fretting. Flood me with your light. Flood me with your spirit. I was born for this hour. Darkness cannot overcome light. Flood our community with light. Flood our state with light. Flood our world with light. Fill me freshly. Ignite your power in me. I pray.